so, you know, we brought you onto the show today. Uh, we're talking about uh, adrenals and adrenalectomy today. So I wanted to just dive into a clinical scenario and, uh, and get you talking. So suppose, suppose a 30 year old female walks into your office. Um, last week, she went to the emergency room, she had some some belly pain. And well, they told her that she had gastritis, but she also happened to have a three centimeter mass in her right adrenal that they found out on a on a CT scan that they got, and uh, they advised her to seek further outpatient care. So, you know, first things first, I imagine you have a well-practiced differential in your mind uh, whenever you're um, confronted with, you know, in adrenal incidentaloma. Uh, for a medical student or a resident encountering an adrenal mass like this, what should we be thinking of? That's a good question. So the first place to start really, and the place that I like to start when I, whenever I'm talking about adrenals or lecturing about adrenals, is how common are incidentally discovered adrenal masses? Because if something is really darn common, then you expect it to be there. If it's not, then maybe that's gonna raise your antennae a little bit more. As it turns out, adrenal masses, so incidentally discovered adrenal masses are relatively common. Um, in the literature, roughly four to 10% of any cross-sectional imaging study will have an adrenal incidentaloma. And if you think, you know, four to 10%, that's not a huge number, but here at the Mayo Clinic, we do roughly 50,000 CT scans a year. So as you can see, it's, it, it doesn't take long for that to add up. And what I always tell my medical students and residents is you are 100% going to encounter these things. The question is, are you gonna recognize it and know what to do with it? But you will encounter them. So this, this sort of a topic I think is relevant, not just for surgeons or endocrine surgeons, really for any type of surgeon who deals with a cross-sectional image, and even more so for emergency room doctors, gynecologists, internists, really anyone who's dealing with cross-sectional images of the abdomen. Again, you're gonna encounter these. Um, and then after I encounter a patient with one, so this 30-year-old this female, as you mentioned, there's really kind of two key questions you have to answer with any patient with an adrenal mass. Number one, is the thing producing anything? Is it biochemically functional? And number two, does it look like a cancer or can, can you rule in or out cancer? Those are the two big questions and those are also the indications for surgery incidentally. The indication to remove an adrenal mass really is boils down to number one, is it producing anything that's gonna be harming the patient? Number two, does it look like a cancer or can you exclude cancer? If either of those answers are really uh, concerning, then you're gonna potentially take that adrenal out if the patient's a fit operative candidate. A, a key question I always get asked is particularly with pheochromocytoma. The question is, do you take the vein first or do you take it last? And there's a couple teaching points. The classic teaching point is you, you, you take it first, right? If, if you ask a medical student that and they've read surgical recall or something, they'll tell you, you take the, the vein with the FIO first. Um, I can tell you that's not always the case. And I, I've made a, a mistake in my career that I'll tell you about. That was a very scary thing. So um, the short story is you can take the vein first or last, and it depends on the clinical scenario. So let's say you're operating on a FIO and the anesthesiologist is freaked out because the blood pressure is 250 and they can't control it. And every time you touch this thing, the blood pressure goes up and you just can't progress the operation. That may be a reasonable indication to take the vein first, because in that circumstance, you can clip that vein and divide it. And reliably, the catecholamine excess is going to drop very quickly and the half-life of catecholamine is very short. And then they're going to be fighting the hypotension. So that's a reasonable place to do that. But if you're operating on a big FIO, which tends to be very vascular, if you take that vein early before you've taken the arteries, you've taken the outflow without taking the inflow. And that tumor is going to develop intratumoral hypertension. And that's a very scary situation because if that capsule at all gets injured or ruptured, that thing bleeds like crazy. And it's very hard to stop until you've totally devascularized it. And I got, to a, I got into a circumstance very early in my career. In fact, I think it was my first, first week here at the Mayo Clinic. I was operating on a 13 centimeter FIO. And uh, I, I decided to take the vein early because we had some hypertension. Um, and that's never a mistake I want to make again. Uh, so I did that. And basically 10 units of blood later, I got the thing out. And this was my first week on staff. The next, uh, the next uh, day, I went to my, my mentor's office, Jeff Thompson, who's a giant in endocrine surgery. He said, oh, yeah, I should have told you that. Never take the vein first. So usually I'll preserve the vein unless I have to take it because uncontrolled hypertension. That being said, the anesthesiologists nowadays tend to be very effective at managing hypertension. They have great medications for that. Generally, the patient's maximally blocked. And so, so it's an unusual circumstance where the hypertension is so profound or recalcitrant that you can't make progress with the operation. So generally, the vein goes last. Speaking of, uh, you know, what anesthesia is furiously doing in the back for a FIO, I think we'd be remiss to, to the interns, medical students, and absite 99 percenters if uh, we didn't ask you to discuss preoperative blockade real quick for, for the FIO. 
Yeah, it's an, it's a very important topic and something you never want to miss. Um, so so ab site is one thing, but also the boards, the common scenario on boards, right? Um, and I this is one of my questions. So on boards, um, as far as uh, or, or ab site, when you're when you're dealing with a pheochromocytoma, you either suspect a pheo or you know it's a pheo for whatever reason. That patient has to be blocked. Now, um, nowadays, it's a bit more controversial how to do that, and we have a number of options. The classic way we do this, and the way we still do this at the Mayo Clinic is alpha blockade. We have a couple options there. What we would usually use here at the Mayo Clinic was phenoxybenzamine, um, nonspecific alpha blocker. That medication is very expensive. It's difficult to get, difficult to push through insurance. The patients get very symptomatic with it. And it leads to a relatively high rate of post-operative hypotension because the long half-life, after you've done with the operation and you've uh, solved the catecholamine problem, that medication lingers around. So that's kind of an older medication. Um, one of the newer things we use, not necessarily new, but uh, newer to us here, is we use Cardura or doxazosin. It's, a, it's a, a selective alpha blocker. It's relatively easy for the patient to get access to as far as uh, cost and insurance. Um, it has less post-operative hypotension but still very effective and safe. So generally that's our go-to, that's an alpha blocker. We generally institute that two weeks before surgery, depending on the patient and circumstances, but usually at least two weeks before surgery. That's titrated up very, very closely. Um, here it's done by our endocrinology colleagues, but, but any sort of physician could do it. It's really a matter of titrating that medication to uh, orthostatic hypotension. And it does kind of run them down. They feel lousy, they have the stuffy nose, they get up and they feel dizzy. Um, but two weeks before surgery, start that. The classic teaching is you're going to want to start that before you start beta blockade. That's one of the pitfall questions on the ab site. Um, you don't want unopposed beta blockade in the absence of alpha blockade in these patients. That can lead to severe hypertension. Now, in addition to blockade, one thing we always want to do with these patients is we really want to load them up with fluid. Um, now, the reason for that is patients who have pheochromocytoma tend to be intravascularly deplete. Now, even though they have high blood pressure, their vascular volume is very constricted. So they have essentially a small tank, right? And as soon as we take out that pheo, they have a vasoplegic effect where their vasculature dilates. Now, if you haven't uh, tanked them up first and their vessels dilate, that relative intravascular volume is very low. That's a setup for severe hypotension, the need for pressors postoperatively. And so the way we get around that is we really tank them up. Um, we give them essentially over three to five days tell them to eat whatever they want as far as salt goes. The one time in their life they're liberalized to eat all the things they, they usually can eat. You know, they can go to Pizza Hut and eat pizza, French fries, hamburgers, whatever, whatever they want to eat. They uh, also push the fluid, um, Gatorades, et cetera. You have to be a little bit uh, careful with patients with congestive heart failure um, in loading them up very rapidly and quickly, but that's generally what we do. Uh, an old way of doing this is you'd admit them to the hospital the night before surgery and then sort of more gently um, hydrate them with, uh, with saline infusion. You still can do that in patients with CHF or if you're concerned for some other reason, but generally just outpatient salt and fluid loading is the way we get around that. And when you do that effectively and you're operating on the right side, you'll see the inferior vena cava tends to be very robust. It's very, you can see it's just, it's, it, it's full of fluid and that's what you want. Um, that can ward off post-operative hypotension. Again, if you don't do that, you may be dealing with a case of the patient has to be in the ICU for two days after surgery, after a very uncomplicated operation, just because of vasoplegia. And you're, you have to give them pressors, but you're giving them catecholamines back essentially because you're fighting that vasoplegic effect. So that's, that's generally our, our method of blockade. There are other options. There are some groups in Europe that don't block at all and they just deal with it uh, from the anesthesia perspective. Um, that is exceptionally controversial and not something I'd recommend doing, but there are studies that suggest that can be done safely with, with current era anesthesia. Um, some people deal with uh, um, this with calcium channel blockers, both preoperatively and intraoperatively. Um, so there are other options, but alpha and beta blockade is generally what we institute here. Well, if we're being charitable to those, uh, to those you know, weirdo Europeans, what, what, uh, what benefit do they claim, you know, can be gained from not doing preoperative blockade? Uh, really three things. So one is um, some of these medications are difficult to get and expensive, and not all of them, but some of them are, so you can bypass that altogether. That's not a big issue nowadays with Cardura. That's uh, relatively cheap and easy to get. Number two is uh, blocking a patient for two weeks. Uh, it sounds easy enough, but from the patient's perspective, it's a terrible thing. You really run them down. Um, if I had some magic switch and dropped your blood pressure down to 80 and made you orthostatic, you're just gonna feel lousy. Um, they get a stuffy nose, they can't sleep at night because they have the stuffy nose. So patients describe essentially being miserable. So again, you can bypass that part of it too. 
And then finally, if you have no blockade on board or only short-term blockade from the OR, you're not gonna have a high rate of post-operative hypotension. And there are a certain portion of the population that end up needing ICU care because of post-operative vasoplegia. Nowadays, that's a low rate, um, probably about 10% in our series here, um, but it's not zero. And ICU care, as you know, is very expensive. Right, right. Well, sp speaking of post-operative care, what other uh, wisdom can you impart on us? I know it, it very much depends on what, you know, what you were taking out in the first place. But, you know, for example, if you were uh, removing a, a cortisol secreting tumor, um, what, what should we look forward to post-operatively? How, how do you manage these patients? No, I'm, I'm glad you asked that particular question because that, that's a question of vital importance. And patients have died um, from, from, number one, not knowing they had cortisol excess. And because of that, number two, not being replaced effectively or appropriately. So it comes down to essentially this. Anytime you're removing any tumor um, of the adrenal gland, you need to know the, the answer to the question, is that tumor producing cortisol in excess? Doesn't matter if it's an adrenal cortical cancer or a small benign uh, cortical adenoma. If it is producing cortisol unilaterally, oftentimes contralaterally, that other normal adrenal gland will be suppressed and it takes time to kick in, it doesn't happen immediately. And it's not just the adrenal gland, it's the hypothalamic pituitary axis that's suppressed. And so if they are producing excess cortisol autonomously, you need to either watch them very, very closely postoperatively, or more commonly, just replace steroids, meaning giving them a stress dose of steroids, usually 50 to 100 of hydrocortisone IV in the OR. And then usually what we do here is 50 IV Q8 hydrocortisone until they're taking uh, at adequate PO, and then we switch them to either PO hydrocortisone or prednisone. Now, eventually that can be tapered off, but it's variable on how long it takes to taper off those oral steroids, sometimes even six months to a year if the patient's producing a lot of cortisol from the, from the mass that you took out. Sometimes if it's just subclinical Cushing's and they're producing just a whiff of cortisol, oftentimes you can taper them off pretty rapidly. Our endocrinology colleagues help with that, but they watch it very closely. They can also do some prov provocative testing of the adrenal with cosentropin stimulation testing to make sure that contralateral adrenal is effectively producing cortisol. If it's not, that is a life-threatening scenario and patients have died in such ways. So is it just cortisol uh, producing tumors where you worry about post-operative adrenal insufficiency or in what other scenarios would you worry about it? If the contralateral adrenal gland looks totally normal on CT scan, it's perfusing and it looks like it's normal shape, symmetry size, I'm usually not too worried about that patient. The, the risk of life-threatening adrenal insufficiency is exceptionally low. But sometimes you have an adrenal gland that looks atrophic or you have an adrenal gland that has another mass in it. One of the common things we see is uh, metastatic disease, bilateral masses. If you have a mass in the contralateral adrenal gland, I think it's uh, something you have to assume that the, until proven otherwise, that, that contralateral adrenal is not gonna be producing enough cortisol. It's incumbent upon us to prove that. Um, but yeah, cortisol is kind of the big scenario. There are a couple uh, metabolic electrolyte issues with aldosterone. Um, if you're taking out a tumor for primary aldosteronism and aldosteronoma, those patients uh, can have recalcitrant hyperkalemia that can be life-threatening. Um, uh, po post-operatively. So we monitor their potassium very closely, usually post-operative day one, and then weekly for four weeks, we'll watch their potassium. That again can be a life-threatening problem, as you guys know, um, hyperkalemia. 